higher. Now in this part we're going to be looking at education. Now this you should find dead easy, because unlike other areas of sociology, such as crime and deviance or mass media, this is something you've all had first-hand experience of. You've all been there, you've all been in education, most of you still are. But the four main areas that sociologists are concerned with are these. Firstly, the role of education in society. Secondly, behaviour and relationships in education, such as teacher-pupil relations. Also in this category comes the hidden curriculum and subcultures. Thirdly, the difference in attainment based on gender, um, social class and ethnicity. And finally, social policies and how they affect education. Education is seen to perform vital roles within society. However, different sociological perspectives perceive these roles as being positive or negative. Negative mainly concerned with perpetuating inequality. The theories we will be looking at are functionalism and Marxism. First of all, we are going to look at the functionalist perspective. Durkheim and Parsons suggested that education as an institution is extremely important as it instills essential similarities required to ensure social order in society. Functionalists argue that education performs the process of secondary socialisation, which is the process by which we learn the norms, values and beliefs of our culture outside of the family. In the family, a person's ascribed status is important, i.e. the status we are born with, such as our sex, ethnicity and social class. However, in school this ascribed status is no longer important as individuals become judged on their achieved status. This means the statuses we acquire throughout our lives, such as qualifications, occupation, etc. According to functionalists, education performs the role of maintaining value consensus within society. This means that everyone within society has a shared set of values and that there is an agreement on acceptable and unacceptable behaviour. Through the process of secondary socialisation, the education system reinforces our shared values and beliefs. Role allocation. According to functionalism, education is based on a meritocracy. In other words, everyone has an equal chance in education, and what an individual puts into the system is what they get out. Therefore, according to functionalism, the education system selects and allocates individuals for their appropriate role in society, based on their skills and ability. For example, to become a surgeon, a person needs to train for many years to acquire skills and knowledge to be successful. In order to be certain that the most capable people are selected for this, they are rewarded with high status and high wages. In this sense, functionalists have a very positive view of the role of education. But criticisms of the functionalist perspective include an assumption that education reflects all the cultures and values in our society. Another major criticism argued by Bowles and Gintis is that rather than transmitting skills, education creates a docile workforce where you accept your fate because of the hidden curriculum in schools. Meritocracy, as suggested by functionalists, is impossible while we have the existence of private schools. Unlike functionalism, Marxism takes a negative view of the role of education in a capitalist society. And the education system plays an important role in reproducing this unequal society. Althusser, a Marxist sociologist, argued that for capitalism to survive, it needs to produce a docile and submissive workforce. Bowles and Gintis were influenced by the work of Althusser and developed his theory. They argued that the role of education was to perpetuate class inequalities. It achieves this through the following. Acceptance of hierarchy. All schools have a hierarchical structure based on head teachers, deputies, teachers, pupils. This prepares pupils for the workplace, 
taking orders from their bosses who are at the top of the work hierarchy. Motivation and learning. In education, we are rewarded with qualifications, such as your AS sociology. By focusing on the material gains achieved by exams, we can take the enjoyment out of a subject. This prepares us for employment when our focus is on our pay packet and not the job itself. Fragmentation of knowledge. Our education system is divided into separate subjects which often appear to be unrelated to other topics. Our knowledge is therefore fragmented and we do not see the links between subjects such as history, media studies and sociology. Work is also fragmented and broken into components in a way that each task seems separated from the other. As you can see, these two theories have very opposing views on the role of education. However, both theories are structuralist theories and believe that the institution is more important than the individual. It is important to keep these perspectives in mind as we continue and ask ourselves these questions. Is this evidence that education is based on a meritocracy where only our achieved status is important? Or is it an unequal system which focuses on our ascribed status? Remember, there are no right or wrong answers to this, as long as you find appropriate evidence to support your points. We are now going to focus on the behaviour and relationships that occur in the education system. These will include the hidden curriculum, teacher-pupil relationships and pupil subcultures. The hidden curriculum is whatever we're taught as part of our education, which doesn't appear on any formal curriculum. In fact, we're often unaware that we're even being taught it. Teacher-pupil relationships. The labelling theory has provided sociologists with an important insight into the behaviour between pupils and students. The labelling theory was first developed by Howard Becker in relation to the study of crime and deviance, and was later applied to the study of teachers' interactions with their pupils. Becker believed that a teacher's label of a pupil had fundamental consequences. We are all given labels, hard-working, shy, troublemaker, intelligent, even stupid. So the labels we are given may not initially be our correct label, but if that label is reinforced over and over again, we may eventually believe we are that label. Becker referred to this as the self-fulfilling prophecy. This is when someone lives up to the label they have been given. For example, the dad in EastEnders, who was told he was stupid at school, is now unable to read and believes he is stupid. An experiment by Rosenthal and Jacobson in 1968 demonstrated the process of the self-fulfilling prophecy. They conducted an experiment in an elementary school. Each pupil was given an IQ test. They then randomly selected 20 pupils and informed their teacher that these pupils would experience a significant increase in their intelligence. After one year, all the pupils were given a second IQ test. The 20 pupils randomly selected showed a marked improvement in the IQ scores. Amazingly so, Rosenthal and Jacobson found that the teacher's behaviour to these 20 pupils had changed during the year. This was because they were teaching in a more positive and encouraging way. The pupils then thought that they were more intelligent because of these labels and therefore worked harder. Some sociologists believe that the existence of subcultures plays a major role in how effective our education system is. A subculture is a subgroup within society that has a different set of norms and values to the wider group. Paul Willis, a neo-Marxist or new Marxist, conducted an ethnographic study on a comprehensive school in the West Midlands. Willis focused his study on 12 working class boys. Willis argued that these boys had formed a counter-school subculture in that the boys saw school as a laugh and made fun of those who conformed by calling them earholes. Instead, they preferred to drink, smoke and hang around. According to Willis, these boys knew that once they had left school, they would end up working at the local factory and saw no point in working hard to achieve qualifications. 
Education attainment. Evidence shows that there are differences in the education attainment of different social groups. We are going to look at social class, gender and ethnicity and see what explanations are provided to explain these differences. Let's begin by looking at social class. Evidence has shown that students from working class backgrounds achieve less than those from middle class backgrounds, even when they have the same IQ. So why is this? Firstly, child rearing has been discovered to have a major impact on educational achievement. Interestingly so, it's been found that middle class children appear to have a major advantage over working class children culturally. One of the reasons for this is because the middle classes have higher expectations for their children. Secondly, working classes are more likely to be placed in lower sets, so putting them at a disadvantage from the outset. So, what is a culturally deprived child? Cultural deprivation. It was suggested in the early 1960s that working class children were deficient in essential skills, values and attitudes. This theory led to positive discrimination. Positive discrimination was an attempt by the government to redress the balance between working class and middle class children. This involved compensatory education, meaning more educational provisions provided for the culturally deprived students. Psychologists believe that these children have missed out during primary socialisation because of a substandard cultural environment, blaming the family and the subculture of their social group. Because of this, positive discrimination was concentrated on in the early years. Another important factor to consider is when children leave school. The working class child is more likely to leave school at 16, while the middle class child is more likely to go on to sixth form or to university. Our present government is attempting to persuade students not to leave education at 16 and is promoting choice and access for all social classes. It has been argued that working class children fail in education because of their lack of knowledge. However, many sociologists argue that factors in their home life are the cause of their underachievement. For example, poor housing, overcrowding, health problems, lack of space to study and not having equipment such as a computer. Now let's look at gender. Is gender a prime factor? News reports would suggest that girls are doing better in education than boys. Girls achieve a higher percentage of A star to C at GCSEs in most subjects. However, Boys are still achieving better results in key subject areas such as biology and maths. And by the time they get to A-levels, boys have caught up with girls. However, traditionally sociologists have been concerned about the underachievement of girls. But since the 1990s, girls began to outperform boys at GCSEs and the attention has shifted to the underachievement of boys. Why has this change occurred? Research by Sue Sharp found that girls' priorities in the 1970s had changed to those in the 1990s. In the 1970s, girls' concerns were in this order. Love, marriage, husband, children and job. These concerns had changed in the 1990s to job, career, being able to support themselves. Lastly, let's look at the question of ethnicity and educational achievement. The success of ethnic minorities in education has been a major concern for the last decade, even more so now with the recognition that we live in a multicultural society. The introduction of the Human Rights Act makes us, as a society, not just morally bound, but legally bound to ensure everyone is treated equally. However, evidence has shown that Afro-Caribbeans, Pakistani and Bangladeshi pupils are less likely to attain higher GCSE results than children of white or Indian origin. Male Caribbeans are overrepresented in special schools for those with learning difficulties, 
and in special units for those with emotional or behavioural problems. The gap between Afro-Caribbeans and Pakistani pupils and their white peers is bigger than it was 10 years ago. And Afro-Caribbean pupils are between three and six times more likely to be permanently excluded from schools than white students of the same sex. And they're more likely to be excluded for longer periods than white students for the same offence. Afro-Caribbeans are overrepresented in the lower sets, even when they get better results than some students on higher streams. They're also more likely to leave school without any qualifications. Also, Afro-Caribbeans are less likely to stay on after 16. And when they do, they are more likely to follow vocational courses, which means relatively fewer obtain A-levels and are less likely to go on to university. So why is the education system failing some ethnic groups? Well, research by Wright suggests that teachers may treat pupils differently according to their ethnicity. Wright found that Asian pupils were assumed to have poor English by their teachers who would often exclude them from group discussions. Teachers also disapproved of many of the customs practiced by Asian pupils, especially among female pupils. Teachers had negative expectations of Afro-Caribbean pupils whom they expected to misbehave. Thank you. So tell me, what policies has your government undertaken in order to improve the educational attainment of British pupils? Well, first of all, can I say that uh, I'm really pleased that you've asked that particular question because this government um, has set about policies to ensure that no primary school pupil will now be taught in a, in a class of more than 30. We've also made uh, literacy and numeracy hours compulsory in every single primary school across the country. Well, that's all well and good, but uh, what about pupils in disadvantaged areas? What have you done for them? Yeah, well, in disadvantaged areas where results are lower than the national average, we've set up education action zones. Uh, we've also uh, begun to close down failing schools and replace them and reopen them with the Fresh Start scheme. And any failing school that is persistently failing may now face the, um, may face the prospect of being taken out of local educational control. In addition to this, any parent who persistently fails to take their child to school now faces a £1,000 fine or indeed the risk of imprisonment. OK. Thank you for making, those, I, thank you for making those points clear to us. Now back over to Studio 7.